um, is that a tremendous amount of ideology and worldview and cultural preference and so on goes into science. That's what I'm telling you. That's why the evolutionary biologists found it so easy to believe that the peppered moth example showed that natural selection could make new things, could make moths and trees and scientific observers. Um, it's because their guard was down because it suited their, their preference. And we find this in all kinds of areas, including, by the way, religion and law. <laughs> I've got to say something about this 19th century reductionistic materialism that I've got. At least my view isn't swallowed hook, line, and sinker from a tradition that's 2,000 years old. Uh, let, let me respond to your question because I think you've, you've said something, you've asked an important question. The question is whether you can be a compatibilist between religion and modern science. That's a really good question. In the evolution course I teach, there's a quite a large contingent of compatibilists, much bigger than the contingent of compatibilists in this audience. By the end of the term, they have almost disappeared. Some of them become creationists. I'm glad to see that happen because it shows they've really listened to what's going on in the class, see the implications of evolution, and say, I want no part of that. And they become creationists. A much larger group of them look at the contrast between naturalism and supernaturalism and decide they want to be naturalists. And they switch over to being naturalists. Why well, do you so, have to be one so, or the other? So all, what I'm trying to say is that during the course, people who believe like you do get fewer and fewer and fewer. I see. How about among scientists? Is that also true? Oh, uh, you know, I've had a terrible time at Cornell finding an evolutionary theist, that is, a theistic evolutionist. <laughs> I want to find one to represent that point of view. I've gone to evolutionists who go to church with their families and ask them, would you please come to my class and represent your point of view in my class? And the response invariably has been, oh, well, I don't really believe any of that stuff. <laughs> yeah, thank you for your question. I am going to step outside of the role of moderator, if I may, sinning against it. And because I, I really would like to ask Professor Probein how you understand the divergence in your class towards creationism or evolutionism if there's no free will. Are, are we all necessitated by your lecture? I knew 99% of this group would believe in free will. The, the catch is, and it's a very simple catch, Making decisions does not guarantee the existence of free will. Even computers can be programmed to make decisions as human beings, or in a much more complex way, programmed to make decisions. So the mere decision-making process does not by itself guarantee the existence of free will. So to my mind, this is the kind of issue you might really Think a little bit more about whether you indeed have free will, whether your sense of freedom when you're making decisions is a real, genuine, and deep freedom, or whether, in fact, your decision is constrained so much by all the things in your background and the set of circumstances you face that indeed another person who knows you well might very well be able to predict your decision. The reason why they can do that is that you are a person who's got deterministic influences in your background. You are a certain person. You face certain circumstances. And so, of course, someone who knows you can predict what kind of decision you're likely to make. All I'm doing is throwing that issue up for you to think about. I don't expect everybody to accept it tonight. Predictability, though, doesn't translate to necessitation. Right. But nor do, this, nor do decisions lead to the existence of free will. Uh, Professor Johnson, I, I just got a quick question. I was hoping you could provide a little clarity. Um, Professor, Professor Provine mentioned a couple times he harped on the uh, Hawaiian fruit fly and seemed to concur that, or seemed to uh, state that you even stated that there was evolution taking place there. 
And I was just, I was just wondering if you could clarify yeah. that. You know, I, to tell you the truth, I don't I really know exactly what I think about the Hawaiian fruit fly. It is claimed to be an example of the kind of, of evolution, which I'm, I'm sure does exist in, in various cases. That is to say, where you get a migration of something into an island environment, uh, and it then inbreeds and so on, and it, and, and it changes. And my point is, I am not concerned really to deny that that sort of thing could happen. Uh, and it may have in that case, but I, d I don't really know enough about it to have a, a, a firm opinion, even about exactly how you know that they're separate species, is, because that's a difficult line to draw in many cases. So I I'm not taking a, a, a position about that, and I'm not exactly sure what the boundaries of microevolution are. What I am, the, the thing that I'm concerned with is how much does it explain? Um, and my position is one which I say has quite a respectable tradition in biology. It's been taken by many of the most eminent people, and I, I, I think the ones who are most willing to go against fashion. And it's that while there is a minor variability, or some, sometimes actually more than minor, which is possible within the pre-existing type, it doesn't tell you how you get plants and animals, or it doesn't tell you how you get fruit flies in the first place. But I think it does tell you something important about Philip Johnson's position. As I argued tonight, and as you could easily ascertain, the genetic differences, the genetic dis distance between early and late species of Hawaiian Drosophila give them that's, far that's greater mo morphological and genetic differences than exist between humans and chimpanzees. It's of no consequence to Phil whether Hawaiian Drosophila evolved naturalistically or not. He obviously doesn't really care about Hawaiian Drosophila. He does care about humans. So just the fact that humans are much no, more I closely talk all related... I about organisms, Will, not just humans. Pardon? I, my, my position, you're the one that keeps bringing up the, 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 uh, the, the human thing. That's your obsession. I bring up human... <laughs> I bring up humans because you claim that humans do not share a common ancestor with chimpanzees, and so there was an act of special creation. And that's because he cares about humans. If he were coming from outer space with the same view he has now, he wouldn't care about the evolution between humans and chimpanzees any more than he would with Hawaiian Drosophila, because they wouldn't be special. He'd have been created by some god on the other planet. Okay, we, I started with the Cambrian explosion, but uh, uh, and and with with the uh, the or, with the origin of life, with the origin of complexity, with the problem of new genetic information, and although that's a friendlier version, it's an, still an ad hominem argument. Uh, well, okay. well, thank you very much for your questions, for being here, and I especially want to thank our speakers, Mr. Moderator. <laughs> I, I do think I do think that a good deal of heat and light was cast up tonight and the best kind and thank you again